through 21, and this morning's theme is God provides. We have a narrative here where Jesus will be feeding over 15,000 people with a few fish and loaves of bread. So it is definitely an example of how God provides for our daily needs. It is Philippians 4.19 that says, My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Paul recognized that it was his God that would supply all his needs, not his wants, but his needs, and it would be according to his riches and glory. Well, God owns everything, so we serve a very wealthy God. I hope to give you a balanced uh, message uh, here this morning. I don't want to get too far or too extreme with it, but I want to be very clear in this narrative that God does provide 5,000 people with a few fish and uh, loaves of bread. And so the evidence is there that he can do that if that is his will. God is always uh, providing for us. Remember Chuck Smith would always say where God guides God provides, right? And and throughout the years, that model has changed by various speakers. Here's one that says, where God leads, he provides your needs. And another one says, God's will done in God's way never lacks God's supply. And someone else said, where he guides, he provides. And it is true, God has always provided. I've experienced that personally but also as a church. And I love the fact, and I love big churches. They're nice, especially as smaller churches, we get to use some of their resources, you know, which are out there, conferences and and so forth, um, (coughs) retreat centers and things like that. But as a small church, we also get to experience the fact that we don't have much and we get to see God sometimes provide for us in miraculous ways. And I love when God does that. I really do like to see him do it and not me do it at all. In this gospel, Matthew records two feedings, one in this chapter and in chapter 15, which he will feed thousands. All four gospels record this one feeding here this morning. For that reason alone, this is a very important miracle for us to uh, really understand. In the feeding of the 5,000, we see that Jesus not only cares for their spiritual needs, And definitely that is a priority with God. He is very concerned with the heart, but he's also concerned with your physical well-being too. I really believe that. When we sit at the feet of Jesus, he meets our needs. When things seem impossible, God or Jesus will enter into the situation and he will then impart his resources to us. So this morning I'm going to look at three things in this Uh, narrative one God will use what you have God will use what you have two God's unlimited resources and three don't waste the leftovers don't waste the leftovers so Jesus is feeding thousands let's go ahead and read the text this morning when Jesus heard it he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself but when the multitude heard it they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place and the hour is already late. Send the multitude away that they may go into the village and buy themselves food. And Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and two fish. And he looked up to heaven. He blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. When Jesus heard it says, well if you remember last week, Matthew introduced us to chapter 14 with Herod seeing Jesus 
and thinking that Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. And so then John does, gives us the details of John the Baptist's death. And so Jesus, hearing possibly that Herod was thinking that he was John the Baptist, he decided that it was time for him to depart by boat to a deserted place, possibly to pray. But more than likely, because it wasn't his timing. You'll see that throughout the scriptures once in a while when Jesus says, it's not my timing. You know, the Father's timing is perfect. And so the timing of Jesus' capture, death, crucifixion, and resurrection was to be according to God's timing. So Jesus goes away. And it's important that we sometimes go away and pray and seek a deserted place and just get with the Lord. But when the multitude heard it, they followed him by foot. And what the writer is really saying is they, they walked on land while Jesus was on the boat in the lake. The Sea of Galilee is huge, but it's not so big that you can't see from the east to the west side. You can actually see if you're up on the hill on the north side down uh, to the south, but you can see across, and so you could probably see Jesus if, if it wasn't a cloudy day, you know, and rain and so forth, but you could probably see him on the boat going off in the distance, and so you would follow him while on land there. Well, they followed him, and when Jesus went out and he saw this great multitude that had followed him, he was moved with compassion, and that is Jesus. He loves people. He came for people. He loved the world that he gave himself for it. And he has compassion as a shepherd would have compassion on his sheep. As a sheep would once in a while be deserted, once in a while would run off and go after that one sheep and bring it back into the fold. The original language here on compassion is talking about stirring to the lowest depths. And so this was not just a, a simple fly-by compassion, oh, look at them, I'm sorry, but this was really felt by Jesus deeply. His heart was for them. God loves them very, very much. And so when Jesus came ashore, he found this large group, and instead of going to this isolated area to pray he began to meet their needs by healing the sick and the suggestion here is that he opened up his doctor's office and everyone came in and they all went out healed that's some power when you go to john chapter 6 and you look at their recount it talks about uh the deity of jesus christ and so you can definitely see through john's perspective that jesus has power and authority to heal and that he is god in the flesh uh, Paul tells us in Timothy that God became flesh. Uh, so it's very clear that Jesus is flesh and he healed them all because of the compassion that he had. And when evening had come, his disciples came to him in that deserted place, uh, barren, isolated, void of anything. The villages were a distance away and they were also concerned about the multitude, but their view was a little different. They, they viewed through their lens through the earthly lens. And when we view through our lens, it's very limited. When we think of things to uh, help others, you know, how do we help them? How can we get them through and, and so forth? Um, it can become very limited. And so they saw the situation and they thought, you know what, they need to go and to the villages and buy food. That was the best solution that they can come up with. There's a great multitude here. We don't have enough food for them. And so we need to let them go early enough because they have to travel. Sounds very logical. So they have to travel to villages. They have to then buy food and sit down and eat with their families. And, and so they suggested that to Jesus Christ. Sometimes we have a, an earthly plane. And as Christians, our, our view should be greater than that because we serve a great God. Uh, you just never know what God can do. I, I, I understand that totally when I try to figure out what God is doing. And I often have that earthly plane. But then once in a while I go, God, I know you can do it so many other ways. And then I try to think like God. Well, if you did this, you know, and I think it's like way out there where I couldn't do it. So I know you can. But then he goes and he does it another way. I'm like, well, how many ways do you have? And it's like, you can't imagine. You can't imagine. But we're so limited, and we do have that attitude of being limited. Reminds me of a, of a story of a man who blew a tire while driving in the country. And so he went to get his spare, and he didn't have a jack. 
He saw a light on the porch in the distance and he decided he was going to walk over there and ask and see if they had a jack. And on his way over there, as we all do, like, oh, I hope they have a jack. I hope they're home. And he's getting closer and closer. And he's like, if they have a jack, I hope they let me borrow it. You know, by the time he gets up to the door, he knocks on the door and says, fine, keep your jack. I don't need it. You know? <laughs> And we, we think ourselves out of these things that God is not able to help us. Remember, we serve a God that can do impossible things. And this is an impossible situation. So Jesus said to them, uh, they don't need to go away. I need you. And he commands them, I want you to give them something to eat. You know, and I'm sure they're like, okay, how much you got? You know, John, Peter, a couple bucks, you know, and how about you? And I, I don't think we have enough. You know, and John tells us there was a little lad who had uh, the fish and the bread, and so they took his lunch. Said, hey, you, give us that. You know, and they come to Jesus with that, you know, a few fish and, and a few loaves of bread. Not much. Uh, in their eyes, they seem like, you know, Lord, this is all we've got. There's really no hope. I think uh, you need to listen to us and you need to send them away and, and then uh, hopefully they'll get something to eat. But what did Jesus say? Bring them here to me. Bring them here to me. It is not what we have that counts with God, but actually what we don't have. The question is, are we willing to release whatever we have to let him be the one to direct us in the disposition of it? That's the question. Lord, I don't know what I have, but what I have, I'll just give it to you. And what can you do with it? Bring what you have and see what Jesus can do with it. See what Jesus can do with it. So my first point, God will use what you have. He will use what you have. When you feel like you have nothing to bring to God, then just say, here I am, Lord. Use me. And God will use you. Because God can use you. It is not your power. It is not your resources. It is God who does these things. Everything we have is a gift from God anyway, right? First Timothy 6.17, all things are gifts from God. They're all from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm talking about the good gifts. I'm not talking about evil and bad things. Don't, don't get confused. I'm talking about the qualities, the gifts of the Spirit and so forth that are in you. The food that we have comes from God. The clothing you wear is from God. The rain that just came down, and thank God it came. We need the rain is from God. A fruitful harvest is from God. Faith is from grace is from God. Wisdom is from God. Life itself comes from God. They're all gifts from God. He gives them to us. We need to understand that. He gives us the strength to even work. And I believe that with all of my heart. I know it to be true. For 21 years I worked for Edison. And I worked very hard. One day I was up in my rafters in the garage to get something down from up there we've got lots of boxes a lot of storage areas for virginia and so she needed a box or i need a box i can't remember and i had made this shelf out of plywood and two by fours and so i had a little step stool stepped on it stepped on the shelf and got up moved the box dropped it down and then when i went to come down i grabbed the two by four and it broke loose and as it broke loose i let out a scream that you could hear a mile away yeah, I do scream. <laughs> and I fell and hit this whole side flat on the garage cement. Roman and, and Virginia come running out. What happened? I go, don't touch me. And I'm laying there. Went to the hospital, had bruised ribs. They never checked my hip. I thought it was just bruised ribs. Eight months later, after, after allowing it to heal, I went to do some normal activities, went to work out, re-injured it, and then re-injured it. Eight years now, Eight years I've been injured and still can't do what I used to do. So don't tell me that God's not in control, that he can take away that easy, that quick. God is the one who provides for us. He provides. And God has been faithful to continue to provide. I I'm stuck with you guys because I can't do anything else. <laughs> Each of us has a unique talent and ability we're probably not all going to be preachers. Otherwise, I'd be down there. You'd all be up here. Or wealthy theologians. But we can all contribute what we do have. What we do have. 
Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12, now there are variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There are variety of services, but the same Lord. There are variety of activities, but the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. It is God who gives us the gifts and the things that we have. He will use what you have. Someone said, let us use what we have and God will give us more. That is so true. It's not scriptural as far as a scripture verse, but it is true about God. He will not be indebted to us. And when we give God, he will always give us more back. I I find that to be Uh, So true. I've seen it in people's lives and how God has been faithful in those who are givers. Isaiah 48 says, The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. And we need to be reminded again and again that we're like that grass. We're disposable. We're temporary. We're we're fleeing. We're we're only for a, a moment. But we're here and gone. We only have one life. To use and what we use in this life isn't dependent upon our resume and our strength and our abilities it's all what God has done in us and has given to us to use for the benefit of others Chuck would often say it's not our ability but our availability And I have seen God use, as he says in Corinthians, the weak things of this world. Why? To confound the wise and that God would receive the glory. So whatever you have, however small it is, you give it to the Lord. Someone said, God never asks us to give what we do not have, but he cannot use what you do not give. We need to be givers. Real quickly, and I shared this with the first service, and my mom's sitting in, in, in the church here. And there's something that I notice about my mom. You know, I've known her for a long time. <laughs> I, I met her back in 1961 when she gave birth to me. <laughs> and somehow I've, I've, she's always been a friend. <laughs> but I've noticed a trait about her. And she didn't know the Lord back then, but she had this trait. She's always been a giver. She's always this person that's always giving away things. She give away my clothes, my toys, everything. <laughs> and she's always been that way. You know, if someone comes to the house to work, you know, she's cooking. Hey, you want some beans and rice and some burritos? You know, come and eat. You know, and they sit down and eat. Thank you very much. She always did those things. You know, and I learned from her by those things. But I noticed that, that no matter what, throughout her life, she's always been a giver. And she doesn't have much, by the way. Not much at all. We grew up on the north side of town, which is the audio area, where Virginia grew up up on the hills with the big homes and stuff, you know. So I married rich into rich. And I say rich from my perspective. From her perspective, she'd say we weren't very rich either. And I would agree with her. But that's where we grew up. And my mom didn't have much. But whatever she had, and oftentimes it was leftovers, she'd give them away. Clothes and food, whatever it was. And one thing that I noticed about God is that no matter how much my mom would give, even to this day, if you go to lunch with her, she's going to want to pay for it all. And she won't let you pay for it. She's stubborn that way. I had my money out the other day in pain, and she's like, no, make forcing the lady to give it back to me. I'm like, mom, let me pay. You need to allow people to be blessed too by giving to you. Amen? Amen. <laughs> she heard that. <laughs> But I noticed something that you know throughout all these years, God has always been faithful to give her. Always. And she always has more. To this day, she's retired. She has my father's pension, her social security, her pension, and so forth. And she does very, very well. You want to know how much she makes? I won't tell you. (laughs) The Lord has provided for her because she has been faithful to be a giver. The more you give, the more God. God gives you because you know that it's not about you. It's about helping others. Jesus has what we need so that we can give to others. To others. So he commanded the multitude, sit down. Give me what you have. And we'll take these five loaves 
of bread and fish and we will give it to the multitude. Notice that Jesus puts them in order. I want you to sit down. I want you to take them and you, I want you to give, give this to the multitude. God's a God of order. Everything's about order. Sit them down and then I will give it to the disciples and the disciples then will give it to you. I love that about God because I'm a, I'm a person of order. I, I just love order. Well, I don't know what kind of person you are. I mean, if you look at your, your desk at home, is it like filled with stuff? You look at my desk and everything's in order and put away and just everything's got to be that way. I even have taken all my checkbooks boxes, put them in my drawers and stapled them together and each box has things in it and separated and so forth. <laughs> but it's the truth. God is a God of order. He orders everything from the sun to the distance of the moon and the earth. Everything's in order. Everything, the seasons are in order. God's a God of order. I'm sorry, but if you're chaotic... Think about God's order, you know? So he orders them to, to sit them all down and then he took the, the bread and the fish and he began to uh, give thanks uh, for it. In verse 20 says, they all ate and were filled and they took up 12 baskets full of the fragments that remained. In other words, they were, they were full till they were gluttoned. I mean, there was no more to, to put into their bodies. God provided abundantly and more that they could even think of. My second point, God's unlimited resources. God has unlimited resources. The disciples were concerned about their physical need while Jesus realized that he could teach his disciples that his resources were beyond what they could imagine. First, Second Corinthians 3, 5 says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. The disciples thought, well, we don't have enough. We're not sufficient. If we were sufficient, we would give to them. But we're not sufficient. And Paul reminds us that it's not our sufficiency. It's God's sufficiency. He is more than enough. He can give us beyond what we can think. It was William Carey, who was the father of modern missionary, who said, expect great things from God. But he also said, attempt great things from God. We serve an awesome God with great resources. And we should not limit him at all. Ephesians 2.20 very clear unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above i mean here are three words that go beyond right exceedingly abundantly and then even above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us unto him be glory in the church by jesus christ throughout the ages and the world without an amen now i'm not I'm not saying that we have to preach the wealth doctrine. You, you name it, you claim it, you blab it, you grab it, and it's yours. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that God has the resources, and if it's his will, as he says here, because he has the resources and the power, and if it's his will, he can do it. James makes it very clear. He, he says, you have not because you ask not. But then when you do ask, you ask amiss because you're asking for your own selfish reasons and you're going to use it up on yourself. And that's why you don't have it. So there's truth on how you use it also and how God will give it to you. D.L. Moody wanted to be used by the Lord and he heard a pastor talking about um, how the world has not yet seen what God can through do through a man who has totally surrendered to him. And D.L. Moody understood understood the power of God the abundantly above more than you can imagine. He said, I want to be that man. I want to be that man, Lord. And he was. We quote him today quite often because he was surrendered to the will of the Lord. There's nothing that God cannot do in our life if it is according to his will that he has done it in many other Christians, churches throughout history. You see, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And, and he is just as active today in the church as he was in the New Testament. He hasn't changed. He still wants the gospel to go out. So God has given us this wonderful promise here in Ephesians 3.20 to help us to take the limits off of our minds pertaining to our God. He wants us to understand that he is not holding anything back. God has always had the priority of helping people. God wants us blessed so that we can be 
a blessing. That is really the key. He wants us to experience abundance in our lives so that we can help others. Doesn't it make sense that Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. So why would he tell his disciples who are not greater than the master, I want you to be served and not served. See what I've done for you all? (laughs) What a great God I am. No, 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 no. I want you to be like me. And he grabbed the apron, he put it around his waist, and he got the disciples and says, come, I'm going to wash your feet. Wow. But we want to consume it on our own. God gave you the wealth. God gave you the gifts. God gave you the talents that you have to be used for the sake of others, not for yourself. Verse 21 says, those who have eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. You could probably add, what, a wife, maybe a child, probably more. So somewhere between fifteen to 20,000 people were fed. That's a lot of people. When, when Forrest was here, we had probably about 500 people here, and it filled up the place times that by 10. That's a lot of people to feed. <clears throat> then we see the leftovers. In verse 20, they all ate and were filled, and they took up 12 baskets full of fragments that remained. So the last point is don't waste the leftovers. Don't waste the leftovers. Scripture makes it clear that God blesses us, not so we can live with greed, but so that we can bless others. Proverbs 11, 25 through 6 says, whoever's blessings, I'm sorry, whoever brings blessings will be enriched. And one who waters will himself be watered. The people curse him who holds back grain, but a blessing is on the head of him who sells it. And so there are blessings for those that don't hold back and don't waste what they have on themselves. God loves a cheerful giver, he tells us in Corinthians chapter 9. I love the word cheerful. In the Greek, it's hilarious. That makes no sense. Why would God use the word hilarious? I think because sometimes we hold on to stuff so tightly and we don't want to let go of it. And that it's almost like hilarious to let it go. I don't, you know, it's like, it's so ridiculous to just throw it away in a sense. We feel that way. But God wants us to let it go and let him be our provider. When we see, or when he sees that someone is is giving freely out of love, God blesses them even more. We are blessed to be a blessing. Last year at our Thanksgiving dinner, that we had for the community. We fed probably around 200 people and yet we still had more left over. And so there were a few people that said, let's make plates. And so we made around 30 to 50 plates from what I heard. And then we took those plates and we then passed them out to the community uh, down in the Santa Ana River, the homeless and anybody that we can find down in that area. So God gave us even more than what we imagined that we would do here. It's a great blessing to be a blessing to others. Someone wrote, God didn't add another day to your life because you needed it. He did it because someone out there needs you. Mm. Hebrews 13, 16 says, Do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Wow. Wow. You want to please God? Then don't forget to do good and to share with others. That's what God says. Don't forget to do good and share with others. You have to get in the habit of doing that. And if your heart is not there, and I know people like that, you know, they're expecting you to buy lunch. They're expecting you to pay the tab. They're always expecting you to give, but they never give because they don't understand giving. They don't have a heart for that because what they do have, they keep because they think that they need it. When my mother was giving up in uh, Victorville, she gave a good amount of time to her sister who grew up at a time where money was hard to get a hold of. And so she learned to always hold on to. And my mom was there to help her because she was unable to help herself. She was at that age, needed someone there, and so she went there to help. And so she gave. But 
she took. She was all about saving, all about holding on to. Mom couldn't watch TV because it wastes electricity. Uh, if you do the washer and dryer, you have to make sure those valves on the, out, on the intakes to the dryer were completely off. At least water would drip out and be a waste. You know? And there are people like that that just everything you've got to save, you've got to cut back, you've got to hold on to because you just never know what's going to happen. Then there are those that just give and give and they don't care about what's going to happen because they know that God will take care of their needs. And God does. Let me close with this. When things seem impossible, Jesus will give you the resources. Time and time again, God has been faithful to do that. I remember one year that our insurance money was due. And it was, I don't know, 300 and something dollars at the time. And me and Virginia thought, how are we going to pay this? Because we need car insurance. Can't drive without car insurance. We've always been very responsible. If you need car insurance, we get car insurance. It's the way we are. And so we needed to get this car insurance just to know what to do. Well, we had some medical issues the year before and so forth. Well, the insurance company ended up sending us a check in the mail. And we got it just before it was due. And it was exactly the amount that we needed. And we're like, wow, God, you are so good. It's amazing how God provides. He knows what your needs are and he shows up in these impossible ways. When we were looking to buy this building, you know, the, the, the owner went through the hardship in 2008, lost everything. People were fighting for this building. They were telling us, get out. And we looked, we were looking at trough school. We were possibly gonna go to trough school and just hold Sunday services without a midweek service. But it was really difficult. They wanted a lot more money uh, and a lot of other things. And we can only use so many rooms and for only so much time. So it's very limited. So I thought, I guess this is it. We're done. God's done with the church and we'll just, you know, move on. Couldn't find any other buildings in the community. Even went to a place over here that has a sanctuary that's 6300. And it was empty and we offered them, could we just rent the sanctuary on Sundays and Wednesdays? Just that, nothing else. Oh no, we want to sell the place. You know, we won't let you do that. So we thought it was over. And then God shows up. And the guy that was fighting for this building, you know, he became an advocate for us. He came to a Sunday morning service and the Lord ministered to him, very wealthy guy. I happened to be teaching about how rich it is for a hard man to enter the kingdom. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And he was just so convicted that he became an advocate. I have to help you own this building. So now we were focused on purchasing the building and not trying to find a building. And God just opened up doors. Even the resources, I had gone to Chuck and I told him the story and he was just, Chuck loves stories like that apparently and he was like, we'll hold the note. But then the Lord says, no, I don't want Chuck to. I'm gonna provide for you. I'm like, wow. And I love when God does that because then I can look at it and say, it wasn't me, it wasn't you, it was the Lord that did this. And that means the Lord is in this work. He is in this work. And so the guy that was at the first lean on the building said, Pastor, tell you what, I'll hold the note for you for interest only. Our payment dropped and we only had to come up with 10,000. He put up 20,000 of his own money. Wow. The following year, we refinanced. Our payment dropped again. And now we're working on getting that paid off uh, every year, paying extra towards the principal. So God is good. He always seems to do the impossible. We thought it was over. We thought we were done. And God says, no, you're not done yet. And he provided, we own this building. And today, in this day and age, churches can't find buildings because communities are not building for churches. They're building for homes and commercial. I even asked the mayor of our community, I said, hey, in your building of our community, have you thought of churches? And she says, oh, huh, that's a good idea. She liked the idea, but they never thought of churches. Churches that are not in their minds. And they need churches in communities. This is what keeps communities stable. It's what keeps our, our state stable, our country stable, is churches. Amen. You go to Calvary Chapel Eastvale, they're renting in a school. You go to Harupa Valley, they're renting in a building. You go to Refuge, they're in the, renting in a building. And all these have major cost. Where here we are, we own our building. Amen. And we, we pay 
a monthly payment of $600. <laughs> God is good. He shows up when it's impossible for you to do things. That's the God that we serve. But remember, what you do have, you have to let him have it. Here it is, Lord. Use it and use it for the glory of you and of others for them. And God's resources will come pouring in and be faithful with the leftovers of what he gives you. Let's pray.